Welcome all to a discussion with Professor Simon May on the question of love. Something so fundamental, one would think that it's a core interest of philosophy. But it seems that there is not just Mr. Heidegger, uh, an oblivion of being, but also an oblivion of love. And Simon has written two volumes on the question of love. And in this first discussion, which basically is based mostly around and on his first book, to which I will link below. In his first book, it's about, and in our conversation, it's about the question, really, what is it? Why is it that we love? And I think it's fair to summarize the position in saying that love is where we find home, home a, a groundedness. And so I hope you enjoy the conversation that I've had with, with Simon. And there will be more, of course. And if you fancy, just get a copy of his book. It's a really good read. It's a tremendous history on the concept of love. And his second volume is his own theory of love. So thank you very much, as always. By the way, just to mention this, your support is welcome. If you like, there's a link to Patreon, etc., just down below. And please leave a comment to get involved in the discussion and share the videos if you like. Thank you very much indeed. I hope you stay well. Welcome, everyone, to Conversation on Love with Simon May, visiting professor at King's College London. Simon has written two volumes, I think, on love, and you can say a few words about that too. And before we begin, would you like to say a few words maybe about those volumes and why you, what triggered you or what caused you to write them? Sure. So, so far I've written two books, as you say, on the philosophy of love. One looks at the history of the concept, so it, so to speak, looks backwards, beginning with how I see our conception of love today in its dominant version, and then asking, so how did we get here? Hmm. Firstly, and secondly, what other conceptions of love have there been in history from which we might learn? And the second volume is, uh, proceeds from, the, from the, my belief that our conception of love today is inadequate to explaining in particular the specificity of love. So by which I mean, why do we love so selectively why do we love just a few people out of all those that we encounter why do we love one parent more than another why do we love one work of art more than another why mm. even do we love one type of landscape more than another and i think that the specificity of love is something that most theories of love in history not just how we think about it today have failed to explain sufficiently so love too often gets reduced to other things like altruism or in the case of r romantic love sexual desire um, where these things are central or can be central to love but they're not what love is reducible to so i the second volume develops so to speak a new understanding or conception of the nature of love and it is what i think love is really grounded in are we good we'll get to that perhaps what in, in what sense is love today then inadequate? So the dominant conception of love today, and you hear this all the time when people speak to each other about their expectations of love, mm -hmm. is, that, is, is that true love, as opposed yeah. to you know, infatuation or merely desire for something or somebody, is unconditional and disinterested. So it is unconditional in the sense that it isn't conditional upon any qualities of the loved one. It's a sort of emanation of yeah. um, desire and self-giving in its ideal form to another person. And a lot of philosophy, oddly enough, has gone along with this. So love is often conceived simply as um, an unconditional self-giving. For example, Harry Frankfurt at Princeton has written a well-known book called the reasons of love uh, promulgate such a view and many others do as well others think that love is merely reducible to a relationship so if there's no relationship there's no love and i dismiss that in my book otherwise how would we account for 
unrequited love, how would we also account for love for beings that are not, that cannot themselves requite? So for example, a work of art doesn't love you back. Um, uh, um, possibly a newborn baby doesn't love you back. They're not at the stage yet where you could meaningfully call their desire for parent love. So, so I, I, I think that love, above all as considered as unconditional and disinterested today, has been misconceived. And I trace this misconception to a secularization of agape. So in other words, ah. un when, we, when the Western world still believed en masse in um, God and in a loving God, a God indeed who's, according to the letter of John in the New Testament, whose nature is love, mm -hmm. love was modeled on divine agape. That's to say human love uh, we read this already in Augustine, we read actually already in St. Paul, human mm -hmm. love is to, modeled on how God is said to love us, which is precisely unconditional. Now this makes a lot of sense in the case of divine love because the monotheistic God by definition is not conditioned by anything beyond him or her or it. The, the, the God is sui generis, mm -hmm. is causa sui, the cause yeah. of itself. Yeah. And so doesn't need any qualities in the loved one to stimulate his love. Now, this is conceived, broadly speaking, obviously I have to summarize here, by the history of Christianity, say, as the way, the model for human love. This is how humans should love. But Christianity has a very important concept, namely grace, yeah. which is, it holds that human beings are themselves not fully capable of such agapeic love. Mm. But only, only if they're capable of it, then only through the grace of God, who somehow infuses them with this capacity to love unconditionally, right? Yeah. So, so fast forward now to the period where the death of God began, yes. which is uh, roughly speaking the 18th century, arguably the 17th century already. Um, and what happens is that this tremendous emotional support that the hu that human being received from the idea that God loves us unconditionally, there's so to speak, we want that to continue. So we let it continue without the religious framework in which alone it makes sense. So to be very short about it, we get rid of grace, we get rid of God, but we continue with the idea that ideal human love is unconditional. And of course, nothing human is unconditional. Yes. So this is how, this is, so to speak, in very briefly, the history of a major error, which has led to love being, in my view, broadly misconceived in our times. Hence, we get to tautologies as love is love, for example, which... Yes, love is love. Or, or, or some people say, you know, the purpose of love is just itself. It's its own purpose, which to me is a pretty meaningless phrase. So what interests me very much is, and in a way it's the focus of both books, really, the underlying focus, is what is the ground of love? Yeah. What, is the, what is the ground of love? Now, again, people today say, well, if you even ask what the ground of love is, you're, so to speak, asking the wrong question because love is groundless. It's this spontaneous. So we're back to the same thing. In fact, people think if you even analyze love, you in some way destroy the very thing you're trying to analyze. Mm -hmm. Now, to almost, as you well know as a philosopher, to almost every major thinker until the 19th century, from ancient Greece onwards, this would have seemed a completely absurd position. So they all had conceptions of how love is grounded. So Plato, as you know, articulate several such possible conceptions. We don't know which one he really thought was the right one. Uh, but the, the most famous one is, is in the symposium is Diotima, through Diotima's speech, which is the idea that love is essentially grounded in, in beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, grounded, it, you, love is inspired by the beauty we see in another uh, and or by goodness, which is equivalent to beauty in this conception. Uh, so love is grounded in beauty, goodness. In Aristotle, we read that love is grounded in similar virtues of character in another, in another, in the loved one. And his favorite form of love, of course, is friendship, is what we translate as friendship, philia. 
so uh, and so and and then you will have the naturalistic thinkers like from lucretius through one side of schopenhauer to freud who believe that love is grounded in sexual desire that's a third way in which love could be grounded so that we love those who we regard as sexually desirable or reproductively suitable and that in turn gets taken up by the evolutionary psychologists and so on so that's a third way of thinking about love but it still sees love as grounded in something it yeah. doesn't say love is just a spontaneous unconditional emotion that gets developed by the religions but they have a whole theology that explains and justifies that so my point is when you when you abandon the theology which had started to happen yeah when god started to die after the 18th or 17th or 18th century then you are left with this residue which simply makes no sense and which has done it in enormous damage to love in the modern era so that's the sort of premise of my work that's very interesting in what sense does it so we get we get rid of god which is the anchor of love of, of unconditional love and hence grace is taken out of the picture too but we want right. to main, we want we want to maintain love as almost the highest value i think somewhere in in the first volume you say love is the promise of a world a future world to come without suffering it's well love 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 becomes uh, i mean one one uh, understanding of the role of love is as as, as part of that a part of a promise of a world of yes i mean the religions that as it were promulgate the idea that there is a world free of suffering after this one mm -hmm. and see love as the royal road to coming to god right which uh, you know augustine i mean there's a vast tradition that sees that um th they certainly hold the view that you've just articulated yes but now we in this that this has been secularized the the, the progressive hope is that there would be a utopia Well, love is, as I think you put it that way, you, you see the first chapter of the first book is love plays God. Uh, is that God so love, takes his place? And exactly, but, but so love plays God, but, but this in two senses. So the kind of well-known sense is simply that love is the supreme value. I mean, love is, so mm -hmm. to speak, occupies the role that God once occupied as the supreme source of value and yes. the supreme being that which there there is not, nothing higher than but i'm going further than that i'm saying love plays god not just in that it's the supreme value which in which of course in turn derives from the conception that god is love so it too is the result of a secularization of a formerly religious concept i'm going further i'm saying the actual our actual conception of love what we think love is the very nature of love in other words This point about it being unconditional, this point about being disinterested, also I didn't mention before, the, the point about it being unvarying, if it's genuine. Love does not alter when it alteration finds, right? Uh, which I think is wrong. Yeah. And Aristotle would have thought, for example, it was wrong. Anyone who, of the ancients who believed that love was conditional would think it was wrong. Uh, so those are, three, those are three examples of what we've taken over from this formerly religious concept while discarding the religion that yeah. David said. Yeah. Uh, uh, what I'm saying is that love plays God not only in that it's, so to speak, our new God, the new thing we worship. It plays God in the sense that it actually structures our very expectations of what we think love is. And that's where it's very dangerous. I'm not arguing that love is not the supreme value. On the contrary, I think love is, you know, certainly one of the if not it might be the supreme value but certainly one of the absolutely indispensable needs of the human heart for reasons i can come into later i can come to later um i'm not arguing with that i'm arguing with seeing the nature of love in this extraordinary hubristic way because this is where it's we're playing right. god we're arrogating to ourselves powers that were formerly uh, regarded as constitutive of god And we're saying we have them. Moreover, we're democratizing them. We're saying pr basically everyone's capable of this kind of unconditionality. And I'm deeply opposed to that kind of hubris. Yes. I think it's, like all hubris, it leads to terrible trouble. Yes, I mean, as we're seeing perhaps right now. But so it's something that we've been talking about um, also up outside the... Uh, um, 
discussion on love now is that subjectivity is, and I think, um, correct me if I'm not quoting it correctly, um, is at its utmost maximum, I think you put it. Does that have to do anything with that kind of hubris in terms of love as well? I think it's part of the same historical progression. I don't yeah. think it's exactly the same phenomenon, no. No, no. Um, but, I mean, but the connected, subjectivity yeah. is the idea that the human subject essentially can control or determines everything that was once given, you know, yeah. and value to gender. That's the, that's the, that's, I don't think that love is, you know, the, the hubris we have about what the nature of love is exactly the same as that, but it's certainly part of the same immense historical progression. Again, since, you know, it's always a fool's game to date things when they exactly yeah. start causing concepts, of course, but let's say roughly, you know, the beginning of what's known as the modern period. So probably more than the 17th century, you know, yeah, than the 18th. So yes, I see it as part of the same historical progression, but not, not as exactly the same phenomenon. And it, it was quite fascinating when you said that at, at, at once love is in that sense, God, a highest value, but also deemed to be, bring about a perfect world without suffering. And then at the same time, however, there's something dangerous, perhaps even terrifying about love. And the way that one of the things that your book mentions, the first volume, is that love is the reason why the Trojan Wars were started, for example. Is that love per se will, cannot and will not bring a world without suffering. It might actually bring tremendous suffering. Correct. I mean, I mean, love is one of the greatest human needs. And neediness, which yeah. is absolutely fine. Yeah. It's think that human beings can be in some, in any dimension of their life without need. Uh, neediness, through its sheer brutality, so to speak, when it's really powerful, as indeed love can be. I see love as, you know, undoubtedly one of our most powerful drives or needs. Yeah. Uh, can be immensely brutal and, you know, it will necessarily start wars in its name, bring down, <laughs> you know, historical orders, ruin the lives of other people. Um, and indeed, also conversely, you know, if we, I mean, we can love those who destroy us. Um, we can love people. I mean, this is where I think it's so important to try to get to the ground of love. What is love really seeking? Mm -hmm. Because love is seeking a good that is so great for the individual that they might be prepared to love one who actually destroys you. That's the, not even a paradox. Yeah. You yeah. know, I think, I think there are, you know, there's so much literature about this. There are so many examples probably we all have in our personal lives. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily that will destroy us, but certainly that haven't, you know, that are inimical to our flourishing in other ways that uh, I'm amazed that anybody finds this surprising or shocking. So, I also don't think that, and I'll come in a moment to what this need is, because I haven't yet articulated it, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't think, for example, you see, to, to me, it's not either a great surprise, nor is, is it an argument against God that for centuries, millennia, people should have loved a God who the fundamental religious texts tell us is also just destructive. Uh, you know, we know that the God of the Old Testament, you know, induced genocide against the Amaleks. We know that the God of the New Testament uh, is far from the loving God that they try to pretend in some churches in order to get people to attend them, but actually uh, has raised punishment into a whole new dimension, namely eternity, which doesn't exist in the same way in the Old Testament. So in the New Testament, you actually have the parable of the sheep and the goats and many other examples. You actually have the idea of eternal punishment uh, and that of course you know is, is is taken i mean the whole thing of hellfire and brimstone and you know the paintings of hieronymus bosch and innumerable other artists and writers uh, um, uh, 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 dwell on this point and uh, we also have the idea of course which is very closely related to the idea of grace of uh, predestination, which already comes in St. Paul, as far as though Jesus doesn't talk about it, but it comes in St. Paul, and then is big time taken up by the great 
church fathers and, uh, you know, Augustine and then, of course, by Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas has the most extraordinary story about imagining two baby twins. And one of them is doomed to eternal damnation. The other is doomed for, is, is destined for salvation. And there is no why. Mm -hmm. There is no why. This is God's, now this is, bear in mind, the God of love we're talking about here. Right? So, yeah. you know, when people say, oh, you know, one of the perverse things is used as an argument against monotheism, that, uh, you know, how could you love an evil God? That's one of the most fundamental theological questions. To me, in a sense, that's not a question that bothers me as much. Yeah. In of, you know, because human love does have needs that, for the sake of which, it will risk such as loving some a being, even at the limit, an all-powerful God, is destructive. Now, I can't postpone any more of the question, what are these needs? Yes, yes. So, the, and, and this goes back to my first point about what is the grounding of love and something's not dealt with. Now, I, you know, I have my own theory, if you like, or understanding of what that is, and people might not agree, people, you know, some people agree with me, some people don't. But I think that what love seeks is not beauty or goodness. I think we see beauty in one we love, but it's not the ground of love. Uh, there are many, many people who are beautiful, for example, who we don't love. So we would have to explain that. I see the ground of love as what I call a promise of ontological rootedness or ontological groundedness. In other words, love responds to a promise. So that promise we could be wrong about. So yes. it's always future directed, it's always hope directed, it always looks for an end point that might well not come about. Uh, and it sees in the loved one a promise of groundedness in the world or in a world that we supremely value. It could be another world. It could be the kingdom of heaven mm -hmm. um, in, which we see, in which we see the possibility for our life trajectory to be grounded to be given value, to be endorsed, to be given beingness, to be given substance, to be given, you know, what used to be called quiddity, fairness. Yeah. Uh, I'm not talking about simple affirmation. I'm not saying that, you know, the loved one tells you you're fantastic or endorses you in some way, endorses your values. They might not, but there's something about them which uh, offers this promise of groundedness mm -hmm. and uh, I do I mean this is this is something I already announced in the first book but I go into in considerable detail in the second and you know you might say so what is this what is it to experience um, another as offering a promise of groundedness and uh, in the second book I go into this in great detail devote a chapter to each of four different uh, ways of experiencing the other uh, and and but one of them I mentioned now I can mention the others in due course is that we glimpse in them um, a lineage or a heritage or a source of life with whose sensibility we deeply identify and this links into a way of thinking about love that we find already in Plato and in many others from Plato to Freud which is that love involves and I'm talking about this in terms of experience I'm not saying this is something that's you know, that we can prove that there's such a lineage in the other. Are you there? Yep. Yeah, yeah, all there. Um, so we read for, or, or already in, 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 in Plato, uh, in one of his understandings of love, that love involves the sensation of a return to an origin. Yeah. The, the, the myth of Aristophanes in the symposium, you know, that, that this myth suggests that we love when we see our other half, a phrase we still use, yeah. we see them as the other half of the whole person that we once were. Now, this is obviously just a mythical way of expressing an experiential dimension of love, what we philosophers would call, you know, the phenomenology of love, in which to glimpse a loved one and to glimpse a promise of this groundedness, because this is part of groundedness, is to see someone whose lineage, i.e. we share something with them, is one to which we wish to return. It's not necessarily an easy thing to 
develop and explain in one sentence. Yeah. But there is this sense of return, and return is a motif that appears throughout. Yeah. Thinking and about uh, right up to Freud. So Freud, for example, talks about regression, the experience of regressing to an origin in romantic love, what he called yeah. the oceanic. Yeah. yeah. So, and we we find this in many other way ways of thinking about love. Now, these use different metaphors. Plato uses one. Freud uses another. Um, um, religious thinkers like Augustine talk about the return to God, who is after all our source and origin. I mean, in a way, the ultimate lineage of humanity. But they're expressing similar points. So my first aspect of ontological mm -hmm. groundedness or rootedness is the idea of experiencing the other in the other a lineage or an origin or a source of life with which we powerfully identify. Now, I go on to say that this doesn't necessarily need to be our own lineage so it's not like you know we only would fall in love with someone who is of the same origin mm -hmm. culturally or ethnically or whatever as us mm -hmm. it's it's more complicated than that yeah but that's the first first aspect of it these if, if you want me to go on the second aspect of it we have the sense that the loved one offers us what i call an ethical home mm -hmm. Uh, and that is that they embody those ultimate values and virtues that are most crucial to our sense of being stably at home in the world. And, and this is a very important and, that of all our ethical commitments, we feel least able to live out on our own. So it's not just that the other one is simply a reflection of everything that we hold to be valuable. It's that in and through them, we see the ability to, as it were, fulfill ethical ends, ultimate ends, that we, that we do not feel able to live out on our own. Uh, that's yeah. the second yeah. element. The third element of ontological rootedness is that we feel that the loved one possesses decisive power to deepen our sense of existing. Now, this is, a ve it's, again, a very difficult thing to put into words briefly, but yeah. this is a power that we feel in another to intensify the reality and the vitality and therefore the validity of our existence. It, it grounds us in the sense that it brings us, to speak in Heideggerian lingo for, for a minute, it brings yeah. us into our own most possibilities almost, or into our most authentic yeah. possibilities. That's what proper love does. But also, because it, but also because it brings us closer, not to this whitewashed version of ourselves, which is just blissful and all good, but also lets us live with our shadows, if you like. And to, totally. Yes, yes, exactly. And, and this, this, this shadow side can also be expressed, um, you know, I mean, this can also obviously therefore be quite sinister. Uh, sinister. So, mm -hmm. you know, this, this power, that, this existential power that we feel the other has over us, which at the limit can feel like a power of life or death. I mean, you know, this is not sort of yeah. just, yeah. I'm, I need to emphasize that my theory is, has nothing to do with just with sort of being comfortable at home in your slippers. I mean, this is... <laughs> This is, a, this is not to do with comfort. Yeah. On the contrary, it can be highly disorienting for reasons I'll come to. Yes. But, but this power, this existential power, for example, is one of the reasons why hostages can fall in love with their captors. I mean, it's so-called Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah. And in a way, all lovers are captives. Mm -hmm. All lovers have an, you know, are in an element of Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, even, even the, I mean, obviously, the, the, the loved one might have the best intentions yeah. and be, be, a, be a magnificent, ethically magnificent human being. But there's always a sense of being a hostage. <laughs> um, yeah. And then for a fourth element that I think is very important, um, which sounds religious but actually needn't be, is that we experience the presence of the loved one as calling us to mm -hmm. our individual, what I call I am. I'm deliberately there using biblical language, or I will be. Yeah. Uh, so, so th there's always an experience of being called. Yes. And all this is, I must emphasize that all this is a purely phenomenological account, a purely experiential account. It's yeah. not something that you could study, you know, objectively and say, you know, a scientist to come in and say, yes, I can see that, you know, you feel you're being called, so to speak, or you feel the other has existential power over you. It's something, it's, it's a very much what philosophers call a first person um, account. And just to say, I think that this particular ground of love I'm trying to point to, yeah. or I 
development is this very particular structure of experience and intentionality can be found in the widest variety of bonds. So it can be found in friendship, in romance, it can be found in parental love and filial love. Yeah. I, I, to, to, to me, and this is again something I know a lot of people disagree with, but to me, because love is highly specific, it's one very particular structure of experience and intentionality and can be found in many, what we call different types of love. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm by no means saying it's only to be found in romance, of course. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the obvious ways in which it's found is in children for their parents, because everything I've just said about being grounded and rooted is, is, is something that a child would feel in their yeah. parents. I'm just looking for a passage in, in, in my Nator book. Unfortunately, I couldn't, I, there's no English, English translation of it. Uh, Philosophische Systematik, Philosophical Systematicity. Uh, where he says something that was, because you mentioned the I am, um, and if I don't find it, I'll just uh, paraphrase it, but he says that creation, if you like, or um, the origin of meaning is, uh, I, so, so this is on the, the Urrätsel des Daseins, the fundamental riddle or mystery of, of Dasein, of existence. I am, I am there, I am, ich bin dir, I'm there for you, yeah. I am yours. And this to him is immediately with creation. So this is what love articulates. Absolutely. Yes, and of course, I am who I am is exactly what God says. Yeah. When he asked, you know, who are you? And in fact, some people say that the more accurate translation of the Hebrew is, I will be who I will be. So it's actually oh. a future-oriented, even time-structured yeah uh, what many scholars say that the the translation you get in most translations says i am who i am you know it's always in, in capitals mm -hmm. you read it is actually the more accurate hebrew i am not in a position to to, to 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 you know confirm or deny that but yeah it is actually i i will be who i will be so it's very mm -hmm. much sounds like a temporally structured utterance existential utterance mm -hmm. yes and Something else that I just thought of when you mentioned returning home, I mean, the, the motive of returning home is, of course, as you know, extremely fundamental. Odysseus returns home. It's a story of returning well, I home. Have whole, I have a whole, I have two case studies, what I call case studies, in my second volume. Yeah. Which the whole of, I think it's part three. And one of them is Odysseus turning to Troy. So I, so to speak, reinterpret, maybe that's put over, you know, glamorizing what I'm doing, but I, I read the Odyssey as expressing the structure of love, not in the conventional sense that Odysseus loves Penelope and you know loves his oikos, his family, his 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 home, and yeah. his you know secret. But the, the very the reason why it's a story of love is precisely that its very structure is a return home. Yes, but this it's not just. I mean, he could be on 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 Ithaca. You know, before and, and then he could meet Penelope and see and, and, and or be separated from him, want to come back to. But the whole point is that he's making this long, arduous journey. And of course, as we know, there are many temptations on the way. Yeah. Some of which he briefly succumbs. Yes. Right. Uh, but he always leaves again because it's the promise of home. It's exactly what I'm saying love is about. It's the promise of home that draws him. Now, that's one thing, if yeah. I can just finish. Oh, my second, I mean, the, the, the trajectory of love, in my conception of it, can be, and again, I can't emphasize enough, but I know, you, you know, you're very much signed up to this, is experiential, yeah. is philological. Yeah. So it's not that we actually have to undertake, you know, on a ship or whatever, a journey home. It's, it's the experiential structure. So one is, so the trajectory of love can be, so to speak, a return. Yeah. Or it can be, which is also a kind of return, it can be an, a forward-looking motion. So my other case study is about Abraham. And mm -hmm. Abraham is, you know, in a dream, is called in Genesis, is called by God to Canaan. That's not his actual home. That's not where his ancestors come from. I mean, he comes from, from Ur, right? <laughs> he comes from Mesopotamia. Yeah. He's, 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 and he's not yet... He's not yet a Hebrew or a Jew. It's very important to realize that. Okay. And he is called by God mm -hmm. in this to leave everything and to go to 
Canaan where his true destiny will be enacted. So this is exactly what I think love calls you to your true destiny. And by the way, the motif of call is exactly exemplified in this story. I mean, he is literally called and he responds to the call and he goes there. And again, it's the journey. Abraham never really gets to and inhabits Canaan. That's very important. None of the patriarchs do. Even Moses doesn't. They, they never settle. And this is a metaphor for the love is extremely temporarily structured. It's, ex it's very much an ongoing thing. There is no end point. I mean, the way the, you know, the talk, the word consummation in love is very misleading because it suggests that there is some kind of point at which love has finally consummated, has finally been achieved. It's always on the way. So now what I want to say, yeah. yeah. Well, what I want to say, just to finish this point, yeah. is that love, in my view, actually ha is uh, a combination, so to speak, of Odysseus and Moses. So love is both a backward, is both, a, no, the word backward is wrong, is both a, a motion of experiential return mm -hmm. to an origin where our home and our groundedness is, and it's a forward-moving motion trajectory to where our future will be yeah where our real home is abraham's real home i mean in the sense of a home the ground of his real destiny is not in where his birthplace that's where he will just continue to live a dust man life uh, uh, just a sort of habitual life yeah where he won't continue where he really will make a destiny and found a whole dynasty well of course he'll end up founding being the father of three religions yeah uh, is 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 in this other place and this is one reason why i want to return to this point that so often so to speak i misunderstood people think i'm talking about just looking for security and comfort and i'm not so the trajectory going to a new place i mean both these stories i'm talking about involve great danger yes Odysseus is famously yeah uh, in, 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 in enough, there's one danger after the other. No sooner has he overcome one than he finds another. And they're all mortal dangers, as you know. I mean, he's only rescued yeah. because he's got a goddess on his side. He wouldn't, get, he wouldn't make it otherwise. Even, even one of the wisest and wiliest men <laughs> in recorded literature, as he yeah. is, you know, known as the resourceful, wily one. Yes. Even he, even he will not make it unless he has almost superhuman powers at his disposal. So that's a, a metaphor for how difficult the journey is and how insecure it is and how uncertain it is. Abraham goes to a totally uncertain future. He has no idea what waits for him in Canaan. He has no idea even what Canaan is, where it is, uh, you know, who is there. There are, of course, other people there already. Um, and what challenges he will face, both on the way, but also getting there. So though both of them are enacting so to speak their supreme destiny yeah the journey of love both the journey of love and in a sense the though there is no real arrival point but the enacting the 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 the, the fulfilling of a destiny at the arrival point so to speak or at, at the point where the destiny is carried out in, in the new place is filled with uncertainty and filled with danger and just to add to the, uh, my point that it's not about security, yeah. uh, you, it involves, in both cases, a fundamental displacement. The journey involves being displaced. It, in many ways, involves being uprooted in order to be more creatively rooted. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I really want to emphasize, you know, that it's not about, as I said, sitting in front of, the open fire with your slippers on and feeling comfortable and protected and in a cocoon and in many ways i think you know this all probably sounds to listeners very abstract in some ways but one of the other great um, illusions of love is that it should be that i mean one is that it's unconditional and disinterested and so on but the other one is that it should be something that should lead to this cocoon like mm. protective achievement and i'm saying no uh, of course finding your destiny living out your destiny is a profoundly secure making 
thrilling, you know, um, enlivening, vitality giving adventure, but it remains full of risk and always vulnerable to losing your way. Yeah. I mean, where the, you know, Odysseus and, and, and Abraham stories are so important. Indeed, all the Genesis stories, you know, Moses too. I mean, these are all journeys. You know, he's escaping from Egypt with, from slavery. He's looking for the promised land. He has to cross a sea. He has innumerable problems and he never really makes it. Moses never lives in the promised land, right? He leads, he's showing the way, he's on the way, but he never gets there. Yeah. And I return to the point that I think the word consummation is extremely inappropriate for, for love. It, when consummation is understood as, as, as some sense of arrival. So I want to emphasize how risk screwed love is, even though, in my view, the motivation of it is this ontological groundedness. The groundedness is not a kind of straightforward at homeness mm -hmm. where you yeah. just find your home and you settle down there. But it could then be an ontological grounding, a grundung, that, that's a, it a is continuous a grounding. grounding it is. That, it's a continuous search for grounding, yes. understanding, as one should, that there is no final stage where you are finally grounded. Yes, there, there, there is no state, just, for example, of authenticity. Just as I was literally about to take that very word out of your yes. mouth, that uh, authenticity... What, you know, it, it's kind of analogous to the misleading conception of authenticity, where people think authenticity is equivalent to some kind of innate potential that you could finally be said to have reached. But no, you can't. I mean, you know, even the greatest creators of history, I mean, did, you know, Beethoven never reached a stage where he said, OK, that's it. I've done it. I found myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, is, this, is the, this is the authentic me, <laughs> you yeah. know, speaking here uh, in, in its ultimate sense. No, it, it's, always an, it's always an ongoing struggle and search yes yeah, so as the ubermensch the overman as it's now translated is a bridge towards another epoch and has yeah. to overcome himself as well and the ubermensch is always overcoming there is no stage of which the ubermensch again that can, another misconception in which the ubermensch has finally been achieved if, if he or she had finally been achieved they would no longer be an ubermensch because they wouldn't be overcoming they would become a last man <laughs> So well, you know, a very high-powered last man. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, and but something that, so again, in the NATO book, there's a, a speech that Gadamer gave in honor of Natorp, um, in honor of his 100th birthday, which, of course, you know, Natorp didn't live to see. And the, the speech ends on Gadamer quoting from Master Eckhart. And Master Eckhart asks, Warum geht ihr aus? Why do you go out? Why do you leave home? And the answer, in order to find home. But in order to find home is, of course, and this, Gadamer says the same answer as was given by Plotin, by the mystics, by Fichte, and as with Hegel, but finding home is exactly as one needs to go out and then finding home. And this made me maybe, I hope, I hope correctly, appreciate from a very different angle why philosophy is called philosophy, the love of wisdom. The love of Sophia is because perhaps because he makes this connection here, Gardema, between this necessity to go out and seek and find this way of grounding and, and or searching for grounding. He makes this connection to philosophy. Perhaps philosophy is this journey too. Absolutely. Oh, I do think so. Yes. It, it's, it's one way of undertaking the journey. Yeah. Yeah. It's one way of undertaking the journey. So thanks for making that's, this that's why the philosophy that no, I think you're absolutely right, and that's why you know philosophy that just so to speak seeks necessary and sufficient conditions and thinks it's nailed it down then once and for all yeah. is so um, sterile. And I mean, it's interesting in a way, but it's not the real thing. And and yeah, uh, yeah totally. No, I, I do think I think philosophy is the way for certain people to seek this home. You know, and others will seek it in other ways. To, to seek this home also in something else and also to seek this intensity, right? And also, but also lean into a certain, well, also terrifying aspect of existence, which, which is... Absolutely. What Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's why I've emphasized that, you know, the, the need for grounding yeah. is so great 
and in my view is one of the few universal needs of humanity yeah very yeah. differently interpreted in different eras which is something we could come to and very differently valued too by the way just to say in a long bracket i think one of the reasons why philosophy I, I think that because love is a search for grounding it becomes more highly valued in eras that take themselves to be alienated from grounding so i think one of the reasons why it's come to be extreme ever high more highly valued in the modern era is because it doesn't mean that we are more alienated than people ever were, but alienation has become a theme in yes. a way that arguably it never was. Uh, you know, obviously with Hegel, Marx and, and, and many others, it's become a theme. And, and, and the whole, you know, the whole cliche, of, I mean, even today, glo globalization, you know, no such thing as secure jobs, secure communities, etc. So love is, has, is, the value of love is not a constant. That's the point I make in both volumes again and again. The value of love is historically determined and it varies according to, I don't mean in exact proportion to, of course, it's not so simple, but it, that, it, 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 it can roughly be, if people say, firstly, it's important to recognize it's not a constant, mm -hmm. it's historically conditioned. And secondly, uh, it, it, it why it varies historically in in why the value of love changes has to do with the degree to which human beings experience themselves as alienated that's just you know in a bracket there i think it's important to 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 say that yeah is there in the in in the histories that you present is there any either being in the the hebrew bible or in maybe christianity plato and nietzsche any of them who gets to this what you call the uh, just an apparent paradox of love that love there's also a terror of love i mean this is something that homer perhaps talks about that the old myths uh, knew that eros can also be a destructive god and not just a god of bringing people so, together for well, example I mean, I, think, I think i mean undoubtedly they um do do get to that i mean i think i think yeah. that the idea of as you you just rightly yourself put it i mean that um you know that that love and desire can lead people to total dis dis destruction of their lives of other people's lives and i think although it's been whitewashed out of christianity i think christianity fantastically judaism and christianity both fantastically articulate this mm -hmm. but it's not in it's not consonant with how we want to see now you know or how religious preachers for example you know present god as as all loving in the sense of also they never really say what they mean by love or they they they, they think that all loving means all kind and gemütlich but it but it but it doesn't yeah. it doesn't and so you know god god i mean if if you read not in the scriptures but the great theologians i mean i've already mentioned augustine aquinas for starters and they're pretty important you know you you'll see stories about eternal damnation you will see stories about Pre predestination where people for no reason discernible to human beings mm. are destroyed from birth are doomed from birth so it's obvious that this god who is the supreme object of love within the religious context and of course the commandment to love god with all your heart and soul and might which appears in the old testament and is repeated by jesus of course when he's asked by the passerby master you know which are the most important of the commandments he says it's the love commandments it's love your neighbor as yourself and love your, the lord your god with all your heart and soul and might and the latter is the more important even of those two because all the great theologians argue i mean most of the great theologians argue for example augustine argues that loving neighbor is for the sake of god so loving god is the prior uh, commandment it's the ground for loving your neighbor Mm -hmm. right you love your neighbor for the sake of god i mean augustine could not be clearer about that so the command to love god is as the supreme object of love with all your heart not with most of it <laughs> with all your heart and soul and might so you know it, it could not be put stronger than that and this god in the very same book is described as sending people to eternal damnation now, as I say, moderns have a problem with that because they want to see love as something that it isn't. They want to see love as purely um, um, 
benevolent. And one of the great mistakes uh, is where love gets reduced to altruism. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, if I would summarize my position very briefly, I would say the self-interest that love has, in other words, this search for ontological groundedness, unleashes or can unleash the greatest self-giving, the greatest altruism of which we're capable. It can also unleash this destructiveness and possessiveness, and it, that doesn't mean it's not genuine love. Uh, and it can also love those who are not benevolent towards us. So the relation between benevolence and love is far more complicated than is often suggested. And as I say, I think that the scriptures uh, actually give a remarkably accurate picture yeah. of the relation between love and benevolence. But it's a huge mistake to reduce love to benevolence. And it's something that's happened, you know, when somebody does a kind act, they say, that was love. Well, it might be love, but it might also be a virtue of character, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah. The virtue of yeah. character. It doesn't mean that we love everyone to whom we're benevolent. Is it? Why shouldn't we be in the benevolent to people we don't love? Hmm. The one-dimensionality is general, a tremendous problem of modernity, isn't it? It's a, a tremendous. So well, I mean, the, the, yeah. the temptation to reduce everything to one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, Exactly. Yeah. And this, one of the things I did want to get to is very briefly only if, if, if time allows is Nietzsche's Amor Fati, because the Amor yes. Fati is a love of what is necessary, right? It's the, probably one of the cruelest articulations of love and one of the most terrifying also, but it has well, become, would... it has become a self-help principle of sorts where, Oh, you know, I just uh, pick and chew and I just, uh, decide to affirm my life for myself and, and will for it's it kind of become a last man principle but when right. you take Nietzsche seriously here he does mention he does point to something terrifying in love also and of course what Nietzsche is doing he doesn't perhaps recognize it or he certainly doesn't articulate it is Nietzsche in many ways is speaking about our um groundedness in the world because if we're to be grounded in how things really are not how we wishfully think them to be or how we escape from them by you know Ill illusion and repression we have to affirm the chain of events as it really is we can't yeah. escape from that that's the first thing so amor fati is, is fundamentally about being grounded in the world mm -hmm. the second thing that's noticeable about amor fati is it obeys the point I was making before about the forward movement and the backward movement. So Amor Fati, as Nietzsche explains it, is we affirm the whole chain of events that's led to where we just are now, right? But it also affirms in doing so, the chain of events that will proceed from there into the future. So it's, it, it is that two-way thing. And Amor Fati is, is one exemplification of how you can't separate them. Because to affirm backwards, you know where he speaks about the chain of events leading just up to this point, yeah. is to affirm forwards. And to affirm forwards is necessarily entails that you affirm backwards because the forward movement only happens out of the chain of events until now. So I think it's excellent you mentioned that point. It's, it's, it's an exemplification of exactly how I'm, or not exactly, but it's an, event, it's an exemplification of two of the aspects of how I think about love, yeah. And it's connected to the eternal recurrence of the same for Nietzsche, isn't it? Of course, that's that's for Nietzsche. I mean, I don't. To, yeah, you too. Yeah. I don't. I don't need that entailment. But yes, it is exactly for him. Yeah. And so, let me try and summarize. Love is a search for being grounded, which ultimately, though almost mustn't be fulfilled because if it were then it would kind of turn it it would negate itself well it's it not that it mustn't be fulfilled it's just that it can't be fulfilled it, it's not that there's some kind of you know it could yeah. be fulfilled but we really should try to avoid it being fulfilled yeah but it just can't be there is no i mean that's what i think you know what i said before for example the parable but i think it's best to see it as a parable of abraham's call to canaan mm -hmm is saying there is no point at which it's finally fulfilled. I mean, even if Abraham had arrived and, and so to speak, set up, you know, started really to live out his own destiny there and that of his, that of his descendants, 
there would be no point at which, as it were, all that would be complete. So it's not that it shouldn't be fulfilled, it's that it can't be. It's always a journey, and you know, you will recognize this, it's always temporarily structured. It's, 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 there's no such thing as love that isn't happening within the trajectory mm -hmm. that moves into a future. So far we've been talking about the grounding of love, but what would be the object of love? So the object of love, the supreme object of love, mm -hmm. has, again, is not static in history. And by the way, in, in our whole discussion, really, I have just been confining myself to love in the Western world, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, by, by which I mean the love that is the offspring of monotheism and Greek philosophy, broadly mm -hmm. speaking, uh, their collision and their mutual. And of course, that does very much include, and that's not the Western world, strictly speaking, it does very much include Islamic love, but I just don't consider myself to be sufficiently conversant with it to, to dare to speak about it. Mm -hmm. But certainly it's true for Jewish and Christian traditions. So in those traditions, the supreme object of love, that's to say the object that's most worth loving, according, and, and this is, it's been a question, by the way, since the beginning of thinking about love, what objects are most worth loving? Mm -hmm. Not just what is the nature of love, but, you know, what should we be loving? What, what objects of love, what uh, are most conducive to a flourishing life? And the answer to that question has changed. Clearly, for many centuries, it was God and the commandment that we spoke about before, about loving God with all your heart and soul and might, mm -hmm. loving God as supreme, is the expression of that. But then after the mid-18th century, let's say, um, as God started to, in inverted commas, die, or belief in God started to wane, the supreme object of love became the romantic partner um, and this has continued more or less until our day but in in our times this has seen in my view a decline mm -hmm. uh, and in its place the supreme object of love is now coming to be the child mm -hmm. so and at the same time because of course the supreme object of love is also that which is most sacred so by definition, practically. So God clearly occupied that position. The romantic partner and romantic love were deemed to be, I mean, just think of Tristan Isolde and many other high romantic creations. There is no higher love. There is no, and by the, there is no higher love. I mean, there is a life without, lived without having achieved that would be a life that was not fully led. That's how. And I think in our era, the child is gradually coming to occupy that position. And by the same token, the child is coming to be the most sacred object. So there is no greater desecration these days than to violate a child. That was not the case uh, 100 years ago mm -hmm. uh, when we had uh, child prostitution, we had child labor. It's hard to believe that in countries like the United States and, and, and the UK, there was child labor at the beginning of the 20th century. We, we, we think of child labor as, you know, ancient history. It's not. Children were down mines, getting terrible diseases, dying young, and nobody thought there was anything special about that. Families, um, and not just agrarian peasant families, yeah. were, were maximizing the number of children in order to maximize the number of laborers. Uh, uh, Children were seen in aristocratic families as bearers of the lineage, as continuing, as bringing on, you know, as, as ways of continuing the family. The idea that the child is an end in itself and the supreme object of love in itself is a very recent one. And I think this is the tremendous innovation, so to speak, of the 20th century, I guess. It's been happening ever since the late 19th century. There's been this gradual increase in the value attached to childhood. Yeah. And I think the very briefly, and I go into this, you know, at length in my second volume, but I think the reasons for this are precisely that the child is the first truly secular supreme object of love. And by, by which I mean romantic love was still structured by old religious categories. It still sought to transcend a world of time 
and to enter into something eternal. Tristan and Isolde have to die in order to consummate their love. They can't do it in this world, so to speak. Yeah. It also yeah. had the conception of overcoming individuality, which is obviously part and parcel of the same thing. So you become one, you become the union. Out of two become one. Even your names, as Tristan and Isolde sing to each other, you know, Isolde says to Tristan, you know, you are Isolde. And Tristan says to Isolde, you are Tristan. I mean, they, they, they are the same person. Mm -hmm. Nobody thinks that a parent and their child are the same person. In fact, that would be regarded as an abusive relationship. Yeah. So um, there is no, to use philosophical lingo, um, love for the child is not parasitic on dualistic concepts of overcoming space and time and individuality and world. It's the opposite. It's the love that is most defiantly worldly, in which borders between the lover and the loved one are actually maintained and respected far from being broken down. Mm -hmm. uh, and in which um, becoming, to use Nietzschean terms, coming rather than being. So there is, again, no point at which love for the child is consummated, like romantic love is thought to be. There's no point at which a parent says, I've now consummated my love for my child. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an ongoing becoming thing. There is no terminus. There's no even end, ideal end goal, temporally speaking. So for, for many reasons, I call it the first truly modern, secular, um, um, supreme object of love. Is the child. Is the child, yes. And is the relation, is, or, or parental love. So I'm talking about parental love. So the, the, yeah. the, the, the love is now no longer, you know, um, I mean, there's, there's love for God, there's, there's friendship love, there's romantic love, you know, there's love for nature. This is, this is a very particular love relationship in which yeah. I believe, you know, the principle that love is grounded in a promise of rootedness is still there, but the object of love has changed. And the object of love is no longer one that, that is structured by religious or dualistic or otherworldly concepts. Would you, would you agree that that's similar to God loving his children? Uh, no, because God does not, um, because God does not have needs in the same way that a parent does. So I don't think it is, I think it's, it's mis misleading to see, in a way misleading to call us children in that same sense. Yeah. But I mean, there are similarities, but it's not yeah. the same yeah. thing, no. Not the same thing, okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. Pleasure. Great talking to you. Great talking to you too.